So thanks for coming back to Heat Transfer. So like in the other Tuesday lectures we've been doing, the first thing that I wanted to do was go over our quiz. This is our last quiz for the course. So um, we won't be doing this again, right? So here, this is on heat exchangers. So here we have two fluids flow in a cross flow heat exchanger. We're given big CP for the hot fluid and a mass flow rate for the hot fluid. And we're told that it enters at 180 degrees Celsius and leaves at 120 degrees Celsius. We're told big CP for the cold fluid, the mass flow rate, and the inlet temperature, but we don't know the outlet temperature. So here, we want to use the fact that we know the... If we assume that the heat exchanger is fully insulated, then all the heat that leaves the hot side has to go into the cold side. So here, we know that m dot cp delta t on the hot side is equal to m dot cp on the cold side or in this case big c h times delta t and big c cold times delta t are equal so here we can just work through the math and we can find an expression for the cold outlet temperature here we see that uh the math that i did i got 103 degrees celsius which is pretty close to 104 which is an answer on our quiz The next question, which of the following has units of watts per Kelvin or watts per degree Celsius and is best described as the rate at which energy should be added to a fluid stream to change it by one degree Celsius? Thermal diffusivity, specific heat, overall heat transfer coefficient, heat capacity rate, or de fluid, I can't even read that. <laughs> it's not E, right? So... If, the, if we were talking about not a flowing stream of fluid, right? If we were talking about, say, a block of aluminum, then the answer here would be specific heat, right? Specific heat tells us how much energy we have to add to something to increase its temperature by one degree. But in this case, we have the fact that the mass is moving through the system. So it's kind of like an open system version of specific heat. And that's the heat capacity rate. So here the answer is D. So sometimes we'll call this big C, whereas specific heat is little c. The next question, two fluids flow into a shell and tube heat exchanger. The hot fluid has a big C value and a mass flow rate and enters the heat exchanger at 180 degrees Celsius. The cold fluid has a big C value and enters at 0.8 kilograms per second and it enters the heat exchanger at 40 degrees Celsius. What is the maximum rate of heat transfer possible in this heat exchanger? So to answer this question, we have to remember that our definition of maximum heat transfer is based on C min times delta T. So we look at the problem and we find which of our fluids can change temperature the most. And that's going to be the fluid that has the C min value. So we look for big C, so m dot times Cp, and then we multiply it times the largest possible temperature difference we can get. So the hottest temperature is the hot inlet, and the coldest temperature is the cold inlet. So here our delta T is hot inlet minus cold inlet. So now we know the values for big C on the hot side and the cold side. So here we can see that C min is the smaller value on the cold side. So now we take big C min multiplied by our biggest temperature difference and we get a Q max of 113.4 kilowatts. And 113 is one of the answers on the quiz. In the next problem, which of the following types of heat exchangers can be analyzed using both the log mean temperature difference and the effectiveness NTU methods? So here, parallel flow and counterflow are the types of heat exchangers where we can use the log mean temperature difference, at least without using a correction factor or a fudge factor. So here, the answer that we want is a and B, because we can use the effectiveness NTU method for all of these options, but we can only use the log mean temperature difference for the parallel flow and the counter flow, at least if we're not using fudge factors.
The next question says two fluids flow into one meter long counterflow concentric heat exchanger that is completely insulated on the outside. So all the fluid, all the heat coming out of the hot side goes into the cold side. The hot fluid has a CP value and a mass flow rate, and so does the cold fluid. Which fluid will experience the largest change in temperature from the inlet to the outlet? So if we're thinking about this problem, again, we can kind of think about this idea of our maximum heat transfer rate or where we get the maximum amount of heat. And when we do that, we look for the fluid that can change the temperature the most. So that fluid is going to have big C min. So here we got to find big C min, right? And we're told C on the hot side and C on the cold side. So we see that the value with the lower big C or the fluid with the lower big C is the cold fluid. So the cold fluid will experience a larger temperature difference between the inlet and the outlet. So that concludes the quiz review. Does anyone have questions about this quiz? Okay, we'll move on to the review content. So I guess uh, it was my birthday this this weekend, I guess, on Friday, really, so I guess not the weekend. So we did some birthday baking, I guess, right? So we have, uh, I made some, some naan, so uh, Indian bread. It was delicious, right? So I followed the... Um, the process here on this channel, oops, on this channel here, it was pretty good. Uh, it was a little bit different because I didn't use yeast. So both of these things that I made this weekend didn't use yeast because we're, uh, we don't have a ton of it. My wife makes sourdough though, so that's pretty cool. So if you're interested in uh, getting yeast, you can learn how to make sourdough bread if you can't find it. The other thing that I made is something that my grandfather taught me how to make a while ago. Um, and it's crepes, although my grandparents who lived in a Romanian or a German village in Romania, they would call this placenta. So it's kind of a very thin pancake or a crepe. Super easy to make. If you have one cup of flour, one cup of milk, and two eggs, or you can scale it however you want, then you'll get very nice crepes. So additions that I've made over the years, so I'll add a little bit of vanilla, which my, uh, my wife's grandparents are French Canadian, so they use a little bit of vanilla. And also they throw in a little bit of melted butter in there and that makes them a little bit, it gives them a little bit of flavor and it also makes them a little bit uh, richer. So super easy to make uh, and absolutely delicious if you top them with sugar or sugar and cinnamon or jam. Very good. So if you're looking to make something that's pretty easy and delicious, I would recommend these crepes. I want to thank everybody who, who's completed the course evaluation. So we've had almost 20% of people in the class complete the course evaluation. I really do appreciate that. Uh, like I said last class, we don't know what's going to happen in the fall, but if we do have to be virtual again, or maybe some kind of hybrid virtual and uh, in person, your feedback on how this is going and, and you know what the things that you liked and the things that we can improve is really valuable. So I would really appreciate your feedback if you can take the time to fill in uh, the course evaluations. But I, I appreciate the fact that you get asked to do this a lot for different classes. So here's a calendar of what I think the rest of the class probably looks like. Oh, thank you. Some birthday wishes. It was uh, pretty exciting. Yeah, we, we just stayed in. But, uh, you know, we had fun. Um, so this is what I think the rest of the class looks like. So today I'm going to do a lecture that reviews all the material from all three different modules. So this is kind of like a, what did you learn in heat transfer? And then I was thinking we have three classes left after this. And we also have three exams that we've posted solutions for on the course website. So I was thinking, although I'm open to other suggestions if people have them, I was thinking about reviewing the practice exams that are posted online. And then, uh, so after we get to the end of next week, then um, 
exams start, and we're pretty close to the beginning of the period. So our exam on SIS is scheduled for, I believe, April the 30th from 4.15 to 6.45 Eastern Standard Time. I think what I want to do, and I've talked to Dr. Dew about this as well, but we'll have a meeting about it this week. Um, and I think I've said this in class before. I'd like to split the exam into two parts so that we do the multiple choice part virtually, probably using something like the, uh, well, the My Courses quiz portal that we're used to using. So maybe you're doing multiple choice questions through My Courses at a time that's not the time that we've set up on the 30th. And then we do the written part of the exam, which will be three long answer questions on the 30th in that two and a half hour time slot. So nominally, the way we think about this is those three long answer problems would take half an hour each. So we would expect to be able to complete this. The time we would give normally in an in-person exam would be an hour and a half for that. Now we have a two and a half hour block on the 30th. So I think that in that time, I think that's a reasonable amount of time to allow people to access the exam, do the problems, and then upload the solutions. Although I have heard from other classes, and again, I'm open to feedback here, that um, what other classes did for their midterms was to have, again, sort of like a quiz link where for each of the long answer problems, students before the end of the time are required to submit their answers to each of the long answer problems. And then maybe there's an extra half an hour or an hour after the exam closes to upload your final solutions. So we may do something like that as well. So things are still a little bit fluid, but we'll definitely, hopefully by the end of next week, certainly by next Tuesday, we will have um, details on how we want to run the final exam. But we still envision it to be sort of the standard final exam that we would give where there are 20 multiple choice questions and three long answer problems and the exam would be cumulative for the whole course. Does anybody have any uh, questions about sort of the exam, the schedule, or maybe um, some kind of feedback or suggestions about what do you think about doing review of these exams over the next three classes? Or if you have other suggestions of things that might be beneficial. You're welcome to unmute yourself or uh, provide feedback in the chat. All right, well, tentatively anyway, this is what I intend to do. Uh, you're certainly free to send me an email uh, if you have other things that you'd like to. I think looking over the exams would be helpful, so that's nice. Um, I Again, as I think it, it makes sense to do, and sort of the timeline works out because we have three classes. So at least tentatively, that's what I'm going to um, prepare for. But if people have other suggestions, I'm happy to entertain them as well. So I think the goal of this class is to sort of review the whole class. So it's, it might feel a little bit like we're drinking from a fire hose here because we're going to go through whatever it is, 14 weeks of material in an hour and a half. But I think that, you know, if you think about this, like when you look back at heat transfer in five years or 10 years, I think the big picture stuff that we want to remember is first – that energy is conserved. So hopefully we remember that from thermodynamics and, and like every other class that you take, right? So that's important, right? So, you know, thermal energy is energy transfer. So energy has to be conserved. But I think the other thing, when I look back on my heat transfer class that I took as an undergraduate, I feel like it was the first class where maybe I was the one that was really making the assumptions. So we do a little bit of modeling in a class like thermo but once you kind of learn every problem type you end up making kind of the same assumptions every time right or or very similar assumptions i think in heat we kind of relax that a little bit where you're doing a little bit more modeling where you have more choices to pick from 
So what kind of correlations are you going to use for H? There's certainly more than one equation, right? So you have to sort of try to make reasonable assumptions. Hopefully what you've gotten out of doing the case studies that we did was sort of an appreciation for how modeling real life problems is actually difficult. And because just because a model gives you a number at the end doesn't mean it's correct, right? I think we're seeing that a lot right now as, as um, you know, models for the virus are being updated all the time, right? Which is a sign of good modeling, right? Is that you have some assumptions, but as you get more data, you update your assumptions, right? And I think that as we see that, we get better models, right? So I think that hopefully it gives us some practical insight on how engineers can sort of systematically try to understand the universe, right? So how do we model problems? So in heat transfer, we sort of broke the class down into three parts, right? So the first part is sort of like fundamentals of heat transfer. So again, if you're going to remember anything coming out of this class, it's sort of like if we were doing sort of a high school level class, or if I was going to do like a three week heat transfer class, I would just teach this first module because with this first module you get a good understanding of how heat transfer works so we know that heat can be transferred in three different ways so heat can move through solids by conduction it can move from a solid to a fluid or a fluid back to a solid by convection in any body that has a temperature is also giving off this electromagnetic radiation. So anything that can sort of has um, a clear view of something else, they're communicating, they're transferring heat, right? And again, I guess the example that I use is if somebody sits in front of you at a campfire, now you don't feel the heat anymore because, uh, you know, if you're not sitting above the campfire, which I, I would highly recommend you don't do that, right? Um, it's the radiation from the flames that's heating you, right? So that's why sometimes if you're sitting on a at a fire on a cold night, you might feel that the front of your body is very warm, but the back of your body is can still be pretty cold, right? So now not only do we sort of conceptually understand these things, but as engineers, we, we try to model them mathematically, right? So to try to understand how heat transfer through a solid works, we use Fourier's law. If we're using convection, we use Newton, Newton's law of cooling. And we also have equations for radiation heat flux, right? Remember, heat flux is heat divided by area. So it's heat per unit area where um, depending on the situation that we're in, because for radiation, like I said, there's sort of they call it a view factor. So how clearly your hot material can see your cold material will change how the heat gets transferred so we talked about two different cases in this class typically we use the large equation large enclosure equation but we also have an equation for parallel plates so then i mean like i said one of the cornerstone pieces of this class uh, and really most classes in engineering is that energy is conserved so we have two different equations that tell us that or maybe one is more simplified. When we have a closed system, right? So if you have a pot with a lid on it and the lid is sealed, then what we do in heat transfer is we know that the stored energy is equal to the energy in minus the energy out plus whatever energy is generated inside of our control volume. But then we also started to look at, certainly for heat exchangers, the whole point is that fluid is moving through our control volume so we also need an equation for open systems. Now this looks a lot like our equation that we used in thermodynamics, but here in our open systems, we have that stored energy is equal to the energy that comes in minus the energy that goes out plus the energy generated in our control volume. So that's like the closed system balance, but then we also have to deal with the mass that's coming in and out of our system. Now in heat, we typically assume that Kinetic energy changes and potential energy changes aren't that important. And usually we're dealing with fluids that aren't changing phase. So our change in specific enthalpy can be modeled as Cp times delta T. 
and that's what this shows. So if we have a system, or so this is talking about energy storage, my apologies. So that energy storage term, we deal with sometimes when we have like a transient problem, problem that's changing in time. So if we have steady state, this I've said throughout the course, my favorite math is when something equals zero. So when we're at steady state, there is no energy storage or depletion in our system, right? Then we can have something like maybe a block of aluminum where it's changing temperature. So the temperature is changing over time, but there's no phase change. So we call this sensible heat. So here we would take M times CP times the change in temperature with time. So that's sensible heat. But then we can also have latent heat. So this is if we're boiling water, for example, or we're melting ice, then we'd have here the m dot term refers to the rate at which mass is being converted from phase one to phase two. So that could be boiling, it could be sublimation, it could be uh, melting, right? And then we're going to multiply by h of the phase change, right? So this is set up almost more like a water boiling problem where we're talking about m dot is the mass flow rate of water boiling and then we'd multiply that by the latent heat of vaporization, which is H sub vapor. So there's three things we can do with this energy storage term, but usually in this class, we've done the first or the second option. Now, the cool thing that we learned in heat transfer, one of the cool things, hopefully, is that um, you don't have to do control volumes. You can have kind of this specialized control volume where in one dimension, the size is so, so small that instead of a control volume, we have a control surface. The great thing about control surfaces is that there's no mass inside of them. Because they have no mass, they can't store energy. There's no aluminum inside of it for its temperature to increase or decrease. There's no water inside of it that can boil. So that energy storage term is zero. There's also no mass in there that's radioactive or generating some kind of a heat. So we have no, those two terms go to zero, which makes our mass balance or our energy balance pretty simple. It's all the energy that comes into our control surface has to go out of our control surface. Now we can come in and out by different modes, right? So in this figure, we have um, conduction heat transfer going into our control surface and radiation and convection coming out. But more generally, we know that the energy in minus the energy out is equal to zero, or that the energy in is equal to the energy out. So these control surfaces are pretty useful. One of the reasons that, that they're useful is that if we have a complicated problem where the geometry gets different, or there's different, there's kind of a, a chain of different thermal resistances in between the temperatures that we know, we can put those together in something that looks like a DC circuit, and we can talk about this idea of thermal resistance. So there's this analogy between electrical, the flow of electrons in a DC circuit to the flow of heat in the universe, right? So all of these heat terms, we can try to cast as being heat transfer is equal to something multiplied by delta T. So the heat transfer is like the current. That's the thing that's flowing. Delta T is like a voltage change, which is what's driving the flow. And then the thing that we multiply by that delta T is one divided by our thermal resistance. So in this case, we're talking about conduction through a plane wall. So in that case, we have our resistance is equal to the thickness of the wall divided by the thermal conductivity times the area. So these things are analogous. It's also I, it's also analogous if you don't, you know, if, if you went into mechanical engineering not to have to think about circuits, you can also think about this as um, a fluid mechanics problem where you have the mass flow rate is equal to the resistance or the sort of like a friction factor, right? That's the resistance multiplied by the pressure difference, where the pressure difference difference is kind of the driver of the fluid flow. 
So common resistances for plane walls, we talked about this already. So conduction in a plane wall, we have an equation for resistance in a cylindrical cross section, right? So I guess this is like an annulus. And then we have in a spherical shell, we have another equation. And, and as is usually the case, as you move from walls to spheres, uh, the math gets a little bit more intricate. But then we can also use this for convection heat transfer, right? Because we have this as uh, HA times delta T. So in this case, our resistance is 1 divided by HA. Here you can see, as our heat transfer coefficient goes up, it's easier to transfer heat. So the resistance goes down, right? We also um, can think about these as the resistance when we're talking about heat flux and then we just have one over h the resistance sort of idea becomes a little bit more complicated when we're talking about radiation because radiation is not something times delta t it's something times at least in this uh small body large enclosure problem it's something times t s to the fourth minus t surface to the fourth so we sort of cheat a little bit. You've got to squint a little bit to make this work, but we can kind of make this look like a radiation heat transfer coefficient where the equation is given here, where it's the emissivity times the Stefan Boltzmann constant times this, um, you know, function of temperatures, right? So we can sort of make this radiation heat transfer coefficient and then plug that in. But we do, and maybe you remember we did this in the first case study, we got to remember that when we do this, maybe sometimes we're going to have to assume what the temperature of the surface is in order to get H rad. And then we're using H rad to find what the temperature of the surface is. So you might get caught in one, in like a, like a loop, right? Where you're iterating through to find what the real temperature of the surface is. So you might have to do this problem multiple times till it converges. Again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage you to do that on an exam where you're sort of time limited, but if you're doing a real problem, uh, you probably want your answers to converge. In the first module, we also talked about fins. So fins are really important for heat transfer. You can see for all of these things, right? Uh, heat transfer goes up as you increase area. So the reason that we add fins is because we know that more heat transfer area should give us more heat transfer. So there's all kinds of different fins, all kinds of geometries that we can deal with. Um, but we started off just thinking about maybe a rectangular fin. And then we remembered that it was really important to get something like the temperature distribution along the fin or the, the amount of heat that's transferred from the fin. It's really important to know what the boundary condition on the tip of the fin is. So we can have convection that's coming off the tip. We can have a tip that's fully insulated or adiabatic. That's B here. C here is we have a particular temperature at the tip. Or we can have a fin that's so long that the end of the fin doesn't even know it's being heated at the base. So we have equations for all those cases. Now, we talked about how we sort of like the adiabatic fin tip because the math's a little bit easier, right? So we have a way to simplify when we have a case where there's convection at the tip. And that's we model this problem to have a little bit of extra length. So we take that area of the fin tip and we say, well, how much length do I have to add to the fin to sort of have that same area that's on the tip. And then I can say that the tip is insulated. And then I can use sort of the, the more basic equation. And this assumption is pretty good as long as your tip area is small relative to the area of the sidewalls of your fin. So here we have, we can, we can get an equation for, um, for the temperature distribution along the fin and then also for the heat transfer from the fin. So now we talked about fins and there's two ways to characterize a fin, right? So we can talk about fin efficiency and we can talk about fin effectiveness. 
So this is one of those things. If, if I ever have you for senior design or something and I'm, and I'm, you know, you're talking about your project and you say, oh, we did this because it was more efficient. I am guaranteed going to ask you what you mean when you say efficient. Because I think that oftentimes efficiency is kind of like um, colloquially used as like goodness, right? But in engineering, when we talk about efficiencies, I mean, these are specific fractions that we're talking about, right? So here we're talking about the heat that comes from the fin divided by the heat that would come from the fin if all of the fin was at the same temperature as the base. We know as we make our fin longer, it's good because we're adding more area. But we get diminishing returns as we add length to our fin because the temperature of the fin is going to decrease the longer that it is, right, as we go along the length. So this fin efficiency is basically telling us how, how close we are to the case where the whole fin had the same temperature as the base. Fin effectiveness is comparing the amount of... So that fin efficiency is always going to be less than 1. So the fin effectiveness is telling us... It's, it's comparing how much heat we get from the real fin divided by how much heat we would have if there was no fins at all. So the effectiveness we would ex expect to be bigger than 1, unless you're trying to retain heat, I guess, right? But here, you want your fin effectiveness to be large, right? So here we, we showed this picture before where, you know, and I asked which one has the higher effectiveness and which one has the higher efficiency. So in this case, fin one would have a higher efficiency because more of the fin would be closer to the base temperature. But fin two is likely to have a higher effectiveness because here we're at, we've added more area, and even though each little bit of, of length we add to the fin, each little bit of heat transfer area we're adding decreases the amount of heat that's added in that little bit that we added, right? You always get a little bit less the longer you make the fin, but you're still transferring more heat than if you didn't have that extra bit until you get to the sort of infinite length fin, right? So... The one that transfers more heat is fin 2. So if you're trying to dissipate heat, you probably want fin 2, even though it's got a lower efficiency. So uh, just because you have more efficiency doesn't mean you have a better fin. So we can get fin efficiencies for different types of geometries by looking in the textbook, right? So there's, um, there's tables that say for different types of fins, we have all these different types of of equations right and we can uh, use those so these we would be we would supply on a test if you needed it right so all kinds of different fin types we have different types of equations even more different shapes right but usually if you if you think about a heat sink it's got more than one fin on it, right? So I don't know if you've ever built your own computer. You look at like a motherboard or a graphics card. They're all going to have um, heat sinks on top of the chips that are generating so much heat, right? And it's not just one big fin that sticks out of your computer. It's a whole network of fins, right? So this is, again, where the idea of thermal resistance is going to help us because we can sort of analyze each individual fin, find the resistance, and then put it together as a whole network. Right? So we can, we can sort of find the resistance for a single fin. And then we know that if we have a bunch of these fins in parallel, then we can get a total resistance. When we do this, we have to remember not just to take the resistance of the fins, but the resistance from the exposed part of the base here. It looks like my pointer is not... Uh, not doing the spotlight part, but hopefully you can still see the arrow on the right. So we have to account for the part of the base that's free here too. So you'd be getting some heat transfer from there as well. So that's what this R base refers to. We also talked about shape factors. Shape factors are nice because sometimes um, we have heat that's going in two dimensions or three dimensions. Right, And we don't always want to solve the uh, heat diffusion equation. And if we're using a common shape, 
we might just be able to find a, a characteristic resistance for that kind of shape. And then we can, uh, we can find the resistance for that case as one over S, which is the shape factor, multiplied by the thermal conductivity of whatever material it's made out of. So the textbook has um, tables with a whole lot of different shape factors in them. Right, so we can look these up and find a case that, that looks like the case we're looking for and then apply that to our problem. So that's the end of the first module. Um, I think maybe instead of waiting right to the end of the class, I'll pause here to see if anyone has questions about module one. Okay, um, so if we look into module two, so module one is just basically like, how does heat transfer work? What are all the things I need to know, right? But we didn't look at some more complicated cases like how do I find the temperature distribution in a solid if it's generating heat? How do I find how temperature changes over time if I'm trying to heat something up, right? So the next thing that we looked at was sort of a deeper dive into conduction. Right? So we talked about Fourier's equation as being a one-dimensional equation. But then we said, well, really, we can be conducting heat in three different dimensions. right? And we can be generating heat and we can be storing heat. So we have this more general equation for conduction in a solid. right? So we can think about, if it's uh, in Cartesian coordinates, heat that's moving in the x direction, the y direction, the z direction. We can account for our material generating heat. So if we have, um, say, like a resistor or like if you think about the tungsten filament in a light bulb, I know they don't probably don't even make light bulbs like that anymore, but it's generating heat as the current passes through it. It's also generating light, right? Um, and then you also, in that case, it happens pretty instantaneously. But if you had a thicker wire, like if you thought about maybe, uh, I don't know, like a space heater or something, Maybe you have a, a thicker gauge or, or the element on your stove is a good example, right? So, you know, you turn your stove on and it's passing current through that element, but it doesn't heat up instantaneously. It takes some time for that coil to get hotter and hotter and eventually it'll even start to glow, right? So it gets very hot. So there's a bunch of assumptions that we can make with this equation. So we often in this class, we, I don't think we'll ever really solve a problem that's the full general case but if we have a case that's isotropic so all the co properties are the same in all the different directions and where k is constant and uniform then what happens is uh, kx is equal to ky is equal to kz and we can pull all of those out because they're constants we divide the whole equation by k and we get this equation beside the orange text then we could further, sometimes we'll have a material that's not generating heat, right? And if it's not generating heat, then that Q dot term goes away. We could have a steady state problem where now my energy storage term, dt by dt, goes to zero, right? Um, and then we could even have a one-dimensional heat transfer case where we're only worried about the heat transfer in one direction. So if it was x in this case, then the y term and the z term would go away. Right, so there's ways to simplify this. So here we could start with the general equation. If we assume it's at steady state, then our energy storage term goes away. If it's 1D conduction, then our X and Z terms go away. You can pick any variable, right? If there's no heat generation, then our Q dot term goes away. And if it's constant conductivity, then the K comes out of our differential term. And we can divide by K and it actually just the K term goes away. So in that case, we get that the second derivative of temperature with X is equal to zero. So that's nice. But what I'd like to know is the temperature distribution inside my material. So I'm going to integrate this twice. So the first time I get the DT by DX, the first derivative of temperature is equal to some constant. And then I integrate it again and I get the T of X is equal to C1X plus C2. So this is nice. It's a general equation. And it tells me that in this case, if I've made these assumptions, I'm going to get a linear temperature distribution inside my material. 
right? And that's what our resistance equation assumes, right? One of the things with resistance is we can't use a resistor if our material is generating heat, right? So we can't sort of model that as a resistor because it doesn't follow this equation. So now here, I have two constants, right? Or I can think about this, I started with a second order ordinary differential equation. So because this was second order, which means, so it was, it's d squared t by dx squared, right? Then I need two boundary conditions, right? And we can see I need two boundary conditions for x because I have two constants here, right? So we could, in the most general case, need two boundary conditions in x, two boundary conditions in y, two boundary conditions in z, and then one temporal condition for how the temperature is changing with time. And almost always we would know the initial condition, but I guess you could do it with some final condition too. So what kind of boundary conditions can we apply in the spatial direction? So the first thing is we can have a constant surface temperature. Right, so here we just know t at some x and all times is equal to some constant. We can have constant heat flux. So this might look like, um, if you think about uh, on your windshield, hopefully we're not dethawing our, uh, our windshields, our, back, our rear windshields too much anymore, right? But when you, um, when you run current through that, then you have a constant heat flux kind of on the surface of that glass where the wire is. Right? So you can have some constant heat flux, so we have an equation for that. Or you can have a surface that's fully insulated or adiabatic. And then the first derivative of temperature with x is zero there. We can also apply this same condition to a line of symmetry. So symmetry lines are nice because then we know that the first derivative um, at that line of symmetry has to be zero. We can also apply convection at a boundary. Right, so we've seen that before where we have we don't know the surface temperature, but we know the heat transfer coefficient and we know the temperature far away from the material. So then we can say on the boundary that all that heat that's coming in from conduction to our boundary has to go out by convection. Now when we're using any of these sort of equations, we can't just blindly plug in like a delta T we have to think about whether or not the equation is true. So I would encourage you, anytime you write down like this convection surface condition, think about, so in this case, right, in this picture down here, oops, right, we have temperature is decreasing with X, right? So because X is moving from left to right and the temperature is going down. So that DT by DX term is negative. So that means the whole left side of my equation, so negative k times dt by dx, which is negative. So the left-hand side of my equation has to be positive because it's a negative times a negative. So that means the right-hand side of my equation should also be positive. So I should make sure that my right-hand side, which is h times delta t, my delta t there should be positive, right? So here, t infinity will be higher than my surface temperature because... Um, it looks like because the temperature is dropping in the material that um, that it, the T infinity has to be higher than the temperature on the surface. So you do have to think about how you're going to use your delta T. So the cool thing about this is that we can use it, one of the cool things I guess, is that we can find the temperature distribution not only in this material that's not generating heat, but we can relax some assumptions and find out what's happening when we are generating heat. So if we started off with that second order ordinary differential equation, but it equaled a constant, which was proportional to our heat generation rate, then when we integrated twice, we would have this equation. So we'd have a temperature as a function of x, but now it's got this x squared term in it. So here, in this case, we have boundary conditions on both edges of our material where those temperatures are known, but they're not the same. So because they're not the same, this is not a symmetric problem. So I can't apply a boundary condition at the center line where, um, where the derivative of temperature with x is equal to zero. So then I would have these two equations. So I'd have an equation for T1 and T2 
as a function of C1 and C2. So I have a system of equations. So I could use these two equations to find an expression for C1 and then I could get an expression for T2 as a function of C1. I could put that, I, so basically I can get C1 and C2 and I can put that all back into my equation and I get something that looks like this, right? So here, if we go in order of these terms, so the first term is a parabolic term, right? Because it's, it's um, a function of X squared. The second term is a linear term because it's multiplied by X and the third term is just some constant. So it's offset by, you know, because it's not right at zero, right? So here we have a superposition of two different solutions. So there's the linear part of the solution, right? Which is given by our second term. And then there's the parabolic part of the solution that we add on top of that. So we get something that looks like our dark red line here. So we can do this for um, plain walls, right? And sometimes that's easiest because we don't have to deal with the complications of uh, cylindrical and spherical coordinates, but we can do it in these other coordinate systems. Um, so we have equations. This is the equation in a cylindrical coordinate system. And then we also have a heat diffusion equation in spherical coordinates as well. So the complexity sometimes ramps up as you... Uh, as you go from sort of a plain wall to a sphere. Right, so that was the, the first two weeks, but then we started to talk about, well, what do we do if we're changing over time? So if you're trying to heat something up, right? So here, I, I tried to draw, in a symmetric case, you put like a block of iron inside an oven, right? And the temperature will increase uh, like is shown here in this figure, right? If it's symmetric where you get this penetration depth and then eventually the center knows that it's being heated and then it all increases up like this, right? So we talked about sort of systematically solving these transient problems. So the first thing that we ask ourselves is, does the temperature distribution in the material actually matter, right? So we calculate this BO number. So it tells us the, the ratio of the resistance to conduction in the material versus convection across the boundary layer of the material, right? And if this is low, then this is lumped. So this is saying that the resistance to conduction in the material is low enough that it basically, the temperature is uniform inside the material. And then I get this equation. So I can solve, I'm only solving for one temperature. So we're saying temperature is only a function of time. But if this BO number is bigger than 0.1, then we got to ask ourselves kind of how far into the problem are we? Does the center of the material know that it's being heated yet or not? Right? So then we check the Fourier number, which is kind of like a dimensionless time. And if the Fourier number is bigger than 0.2, then we'll say that this is a first term approximation. So the center of the material knows it's being heated. So I have this equation and there's this line of symmetry in the middle. So I can use this first term approximation. If the Fourier number is low, so it's not 0.2 yet, then we say that this, there is no line of symmetry in the middle because the, the center of the material doesn't even know it's being heated up yet, right? So then we might want to calculate the penetration depth, which is lowercase delta, and we want to make sure, I mean, it should be, if we get to this part of the flowchart, um, if it doesn't fit all three of these things, then either uh, it's not a great problem for this class, or maybe we calculated something wrong. But delta should be less than LC, where L sub C is the distance from our surface to uh, either an adiabatic line or a line of symmetry in the problem. So in this case, where the center doesn't know it's being heated yet, then we've got this semi-infinite solution, right? So I'll go through each of these um, options in a little bit more depth here, right? So the BO number, again, when the BO number is low, we're gonna have a temperature distribution that looks like over here where the temperatures are pretty constant, right? But as BO number gets bigger, we get more of a temperature profile inside the material. So we'll use this lump capacitance method when the BO number is low 
and then other other methods when the BO number is high. So this is kind of like if we took the heat diffusion equation, um, and now it's an ordinary differential equation again, but ordinary in time and not in space. Right? So here we, we start with this same equation that we talked about before, right? But we're going to assume that, so if you're like this um, polar bear swimmer, right? We're going to assume that there's no phase change, no heat generation, no energy coming into the person, right? Only energy leaving by convection, right? And then we're going to get this equation where all the heat that gets convected away from the body is going to be, you know, is going to come from a drop in temperature of the body, right? It's not quite true in humans because um, our bodies are kind of amazing machines, so we can generate heat, right? Um, so we, but if it was true, right, we'd get this equation, right? And then we could take this differential equation, right? Because it's a little bit cumbersome. So we can define a new variable, theta, which is a change, or a difference in temperature. So our surface temperature at a given time minus T infinity, right? And we're also going to define this time constant, tau, which is a function of some of the material properties that we have, right? So if we do that, right, we can also define a dimensionless temperature difference where we take theta at time divided by whatever our initial time is. Right? So if we make these substitutions, our differential equation looks a little bit nicer. Right? And we so this is, you know, because this one happens is that other people have already solved a bunch of differential equations. So if we can set up our math to look like a problem someone else has already solved, then I don't have to solve it. I just look on the equation sheet and say, oh, what's the answer? Right? So here we have an equation. Right? And if we apply our initial condition at time zero, we know what the temperature difference was, right? Theta naught. Then the thing about e to the power of zero when time is equal to zero is equal to one, right? So then our C1 is equal to our initial temperature difference. So we can actually get C1 right out of the equation by sort of implementing this dimensionless temperature difference, theta star, and that's going to be equal to this exponential term where E is equal to, or where this dimensionless temperature difference is equal to E to the power of negative T over tau. Right? So if we also want to find the total heat transferred, then if we know the temperature uh, difference at whatever time we're at, then we can say M times CP times delta T. So the time constant is important and it's going to be different for every problem, right? And the way that we've defined it here, it doesn't matter if we're heating something up or cooling something down, right? So I have a problem, right? And, and I, with a given time constant, I get this orange line. Now, if my time constant goes up, what that means is that things are happening more slowly, right? So then my, the way that my temperature would change with time would be, you know, the slope of this line would be smaller, right? But if my time constant goes down, things are happening faster, so my, the slope of my line is is bigger everywhere, right? So the time constant kind of gives us some characteristic time of how fast things are happening. So if we're doing some kind of lumped analysis, right, we want to identify our control volume, right, our lumped mass, Check the BO number. So usually we define BO number by H, but we could have a material that's covered in different layers of insulation. So we can find an effective heat transfer coefficient or capital U, right? So if we define our BO number by capital U, right? We want to see that it's small. We do the first law analysis. So we get that equation, right? And then we do the substitutions. We define our time constant. Again, in our time constant, if we're using an effective heat transfer coefficient, then we're going to have U in our time constant instead of just H. We know that C1 is our initial condition. And then we can put this into the solution that we have to find how much time it takes to heat something up or cool something down. So that's if it's lumped, but not all problems are lumped, right? So if the problem is not lumped, 
we have to know kind of how far into the problem we are if our Fourier number is low or high, right? So if our Fourier number is high, right? So this is like the stake, the center of the stake here, um, hopefully is not brown, but maybe it's just pink instead of red, right? So, so here, uh, this is not rare in the middle. So the center of the stake is being heated up, right? But when the Fourier number is low, that means that the, the center of the stake is still raw. It hasn't even been heated up at all because it doesn't even know that it's on the, on the pan, right? So in this case, we're still, all these things still come from the heat diffusion equation, right? There's just different sets of assumptions that are used to get to these different solutions. So we have to know what those assumptions are and what the boundary conditions we're applying are to make sure that we're, that we're able to use our different equations, right? But when we get those equations, we want them to, we want to collapse them because it's actually kind of a difficult problem, right? So that's why we use, you know, we introduced the idea, we're going to use the BO number, the Fourier number, we have dimensionless temperature differences and dimensionless distances. We have boundary conditions where there's a symmetry condition at the center, right? Or maybe an insulated wall. And then we have a convection con condition on the edge. And if these things are true for a Cartesian wall, then we get this approximate solution up here, right? So this is, um, this is a Taylor series. Right? And the thing about Taylor series is that each sort of successive term is smaller and smaller, right? So this is like a, it's, a, it's like a sum of sine waves or coast waves, but the amplitude goes down for each successive term. So a lot of times what we do in engineering is we start with saying, well, what if only the first term is important? So in the first term approximation, that's exactly what we do. And then we have equations for uh, what does the temperature different distribution look like over time? Right? What does the initial temperature distribution look like? How much heat is transferred at a particular time? Right? So these are all solved already. We have these equations. We do need to know what the BO number is so we can look up what the different constants are. So the constants in this, in this equation for a plane wall are C1 and zeta1, uh, but the constants might be different for uh, cylinders and spheres. Right? So we talked about this for a plane wall first but we can also do this with uh, cylinders and spheres. So if that doesn't work in the center of the material, doesn't know it's being heated up yet, right? So if we have a low Fourier number, then um, we can use this semi-infinite approximation, right? So there's no real symmetry in this problem. We're looking for some penetration depth, right? So delta, where we know that's less than the sort of half length or the length from the surface to the line of symmetry. Right? And once it's once delta is bigger than L, then it's no longer semi-infinite. So we have different solutions for the semi-infinite um, solution depending on what the boundary conditions are. So if we have a constant surface temperature, then we use this equation. If we have a constant convection at the surface, then we use this equation here. And if we have constant heat flux, then we use this equation. So... Um, I mean, these equations aren't super easy to use. We understand that you can't necessarily put these into your calculator, depending on the calculator that you have. So um, if we did give this kind of a problem on an exam, we would give you some sort of table where you could look up values of the error function and the complementary error function uh, as a function of whatever the argument is inside. So our last module, which I'll try to cover in the next 15 minutes, is convection. So hopefully this is basically um, sort of when we started to go virtual, right? So um, we start with internal and external convection. And if we do those problems, they all kind of look the same. We follow this flow chart, right? Um, for external convection, we know that this would be easy if we knew the temperature profile uh, sort of just in our boundary layer, but we don't usually know that, right? So we got to make some sort of experimental correlations, right? So here we sort of physically understand what happens to the convection coefficient as we move down the plate. So convection coefficients tend to drop. So you start laminar on the plate, right? The convection coefficient drops as you move down the plate, but then you transition to turbulence, at least sometimes, and you get this kind of step up in H, 
and then H again begins to decline. Right? Turns out this problem is difficult too. So we try to solve this again. We try to collapse the problem non-dimensionally. So we introduce the idea of the Prandtl number and the Nusselt number. Right? So we have uh, definitions for these things here. Right? And then it turns out for different cases, we have uh, different correlations. So we need to know if the system is laminar or it's turbulent. And we need to know what the boundary condition on the plate is. So does it have a constant temperature or a constant heat flux? And, you know, as we go through these, as we've seen in these different example problems, um, once we know these things, then we can pick the right Nusselt number correlation, right? And then we got to think about, do we want a local Nusselt number correlation? We want to know the temperature difference between the plate and the fluid at a particular space. Or do we want the average Nusselt number correlation? So maybe we're trying to find how much heat's been transferred from the plate. We can do this also if we have a constant heat flux instead of a constant surface temperature. It doesn't have to be a plate. We can do this for flow over cylinders as well. Um, now we define our Reynolds number differently than we would if it was uh, flow over a plate. So we may have to use the diameter or if it's not a circular uh, pillar, then hydraulic diameter. I'd, I'd prefer not to use this correlation that's here, as you see in the examples that I posted online. Instead, I like to use, uh, so for if, if it was a laminar pillar that was either circular or non-circular, I would like to use um, this particular uh, set of equations and the uh, um, table that's here. But if it's turbulent, oh, but if it's turbulent, then I would like to use, it's another equation that looks like looks the same as this and I think I'm just trying to find different values of M when I'm uh, depending on the on the case that I'm in so then we talked about not just flow over an external plate but what happens when we have flow through a tube or a duct right and the reason this is different is because our boundary layers from the different surfaces start to overlap right so we saw this in fluid mechanics where we have some entrance region where the center of this flow is still at whatever the free stream velocity is. And the boundary layer it only comes out over here, but they haven't overlapped yet. But then once we get into this fully developed region, in a laminar flow anyway, we get this sort of parabolic velocity profile that we all kind of know and love. Right? Um, Thermal boundary layers are kind of the same where there's still an entrance, entrance region and then a fully developed region. You'll get different temperature profiles depending on whether you have a constant or a constant surface temperature or a constant heat flux, right? But you still use the same terminology where we have an entrance region, a fully developed region. Um, we have an entrance length. So how long does it take to get to the fully developed region? And that entrance length might be different for the hydrodynamic case, so the, the velocity profile, and the temperature profile, the thermal case. There are some similarities. In a hydrodynamic case, the friction factor changes while you're developing, but gets constant after you've developed. Uh, in heat transfer, the heat transfer coefficient changes while the flow is developing, but then it becomes constant after it's fully developed. We can think about the Prandtl number as sort of a relative measure of the size of the boundary layers, right? So it's also then a relative measure of the size of the entrance lengths. So a larger Prandtl number means that the thermal flow takes a longer time to develop or a longer length to develop than the hydrodynamic flow. When we're trying to solve these problems, first we need to know whether it's laminar or turbulent. And then we need to know whether it's developing or fully developed. And once we know that, then we can pick the right Nusselt number correlation. So if we have laminar flow, our Nusselt number correlation is just constant. And if it's turbulent flow and fully developed, both of these are fully developed cases, then, um, then we have this Nusselt number correlation down here where we have to pick the value of N depending on whether we're heating the fluid up or cooling the fluid down. We can do this for non-circular channels as well, but then when we're calculating these dimensionless parameters, we use the hydraulic diameter, which is four times the area divided by the perimeter. 
or we can get and then we just put that value for the hydraulic diameter into our Reynolds number and our Nussle number. If we're doing this for non-circular cross sections that are laminar, they'll still be constant values, but the value you get is dependent on your aspect ratio of your duct. And if it's turbulent, it doesn't really matter what the shape is. We're always going to use this same Nusselt number correlation here. But we use the hydraulic diameter instead of the diameter. Uh, we saw this in some of the problems that we did, but you don't always know what the temperatures are. And you need to know the temperatures to find the fluid properties. So sometimes you just have to guess what the temperature is. So in these internal problems, the, the temperature you find these properties at is the inlet temperature plus the outlet temperature divided by two, so the average temperature. But maybe you don't know the outlet temperature, so you guess. And then you guess, and then you check at the end, and then you see how much your parameters are changing with temperature, right? So in real life, again, you'd iterate through until your properties converged. But on an exam, you don't do that. You pick a number, you use a value, you recognize, you, you make a note that you're going to check. So you had to assume what the outlet temperature was to find the average temperature. You find the outlet temperature. You say, look, it's the same or close, and that's good. Or you say, hey, this is really far apart. And if I had, you know, if I was doing this in real life, I would iterate to get to a place where they converged. But don't spend your time iterating on an exam. So if we're trying to find um, the heat transfer, Right, so we can do that M times CP times delta T will tell us the heat transfer, right? And then we can get this. So this is uh, if we have constant heat flux. The nice thing about constant heat flux is that we know that the total heat is also going to be the heat transfer times the area, where the heat transfer area here is the perimeter of our duct that's touching the fluid. We call that the wetted perimeter, multiplied by the length of the duct. So then usually you can use this to find this temperature uh, whatever temperature you're looking at at X and then once you know temperature of X then you can find the temperature of the surface right so this tells you the fluid temperature at X and then you can find the surface temperature at X by doing a surface balance on the the wetted surface of the pipe it's a little trickier when it's a constant temperature boundary condition so here you you know we end up having to use log mean temperature differences we have this um, this equation for our temperature difference at X divided by our initial temperature difference, right? And that's got this exponential term in it. So we can see how the temperature is evolving through the pipe. But we don't know the heat transfer because we don't know the heat flux. It's not constant. So we can't sort of just find the total heat transfer by um, multiplying Q double prime by the area. So we can still use M times CP times delta T but then we use something that looks kind of like Newton's second law in these constant temperature problems, where it's H times A. It's still times a temperature difference, but that temperature difference is the log mean temperature difference, which is defined down here, right? So you can do this at any length down the pipe or for the whole pipe if X is equal to L. The last thing we talked about was how to do heat exchangers. Um, I set up that two by two matrix and all the online problems that we did. And I think that's good. So you've got to know what your objective is. Are you trying to find the size of the heat exchanger or are you trying to find uh, how much heat is transferred by the heat exchanger? And that's going to change how you solve the problem, right? So you need to know the type of uh, heat exchanger you're going to use. Is it parallel flow, counter flow, cross flow, or some kind of shell and tube bundle? So, we can still, we can always use finding the heat, excuse me, finding the heat. So we can use MCP delta T is equal on both sides, excuse me. And we call this uh, fluid heat capacity rate. Capital C is M dot times CP. Um, we need to know the resistance between the hot side and the cold side of our fluid. So that's made up of uh, convection on the inside and the outside, but also conduction through the wall. We usually assume that the thickness of the wall is very small. So then we can get an effective heat transfer coefficient just by looking at the heat transfer coefficients on the inside and the outside of our tubes. If we're using a parallel or counterflow heat exchanger, we can use the log mean temperature difference. 
If that's the case, then we know that the heat transfer is equal to the effective heat transfer coefficient times the area times the log mean temperature difference. And here it's the same for parallel and counterflow in that we have delta T1 and delta T2 in these equations, but the definitions of those change. So delta T1 always touches the hot inlet, and it's whatever port on the cold side is in communication with the hot inlet. So if we're in parallel flow, delta T1 is H I at T hot in minus T cold in, and delta T2 always talks about the hot outlet, so it's hot outlet minus cold outlet. It's almost the same in counterflow, except now the hot inlet is touching the cold outlet, so that changes delta T1, and the hot outlet is touching the cold inlet, so that changes delta T2. So if we're going to use the more complicated uh, geometries, and even for um, parallel or counterflow heat exchangers, if you don't know everything on one side, so if you can't find the total heat transfer, you have to use effectiveness NTU. So here you you find, you know, we have two different flow charts here. One for if we're sizing the heat exchanger and the other if we're trying to find the amount of heat, right? And the first two steps are always the same, but then we're either going to get the effectiveness and use the effectiveness to find NTU or we're going to find NTU and use NTU to find effectiveness. So if we're sizing, we use the definition of effectiveness to find effectiveness and then we find an equation that tells us NTU is a function of effectiveness. And then in the definition of NTU is the area. So if you don't know your delta T's, you have to do this, right? So if you're trying to find heat transfer, right? Um, we can use our effectiveness equation and our effectiveness equation is gonna tell us our actual heat transfer divided by our maximum heat transfer. We know maximum heat transfer in a heat exchanger is going to be big C min times T hot in minus T cold in. So that's the biggest temperature difference we can see in our heat exchanger. Um, in the textbook, there are tables that give us the definition of NTU as a function of effectiveness and the definition of effectiveness as a function of NTU. So if we're using this method, we'll have to use these tables. And if you need to use them on an exam, we will reproduce these tables for you on the exam. Right, so here in the definition for NTU, we have the area. So if we know the effective heat transfer coefficient and we know C min, and we've found NTU, then we can use that to find the area. All right, so this is just how do you find the heat transfer. So it's, it's a similar process, but it's a little bit different. Right, so here are the first two steps are the same. But before, if we were sizing, we would find effectiveness first and use effectiveness to find NTU. But now that we're finding the heat transfer, we find NTU first from the definition because we know the area already. And then we use that to find effectiveness. And then we use the definition of effectiveness and the definition of Qmax to find Q actual. Right? So then we would use a table like this that gives us effectiveness as a function of NTU. Right? So then again, we would then use that would give us effectiveness and we use the definition of effectiveness to find Q actual. So I guess the last bit of advice that I always give people when they're studying for exams is that, um, you know, it's really important to sleep. Uh, I think that, uh, maybe I'll forward you this podcast, but there's a podcast that I listened to, uh, a guy named Peter Atia, who's a, uh, doctor. He's interested in longevity, but he interviewed a guy who wrote a book called why we sleep. I think his name is Matt Walker. And he talks about all the great benefits to your brain of sleeping and also just your general health. So sleeping is super, super important. So I hope that as you're ending the term and maybe you have projects and things due and you're starting to study for exams, that you um, do your best to sleep because a lot of times I think sleeping is the best form of studying. When you sleep, you convert memories from short-term to long-term memory. So if you're trying to remember things, that's important. So that's all I want to talk about today. I know we're pretty much right up against the time, but I've got at least 15 minutes here if people want to stick around if anybody has any questions. Thank you. On the final, are we given coefficient tables and equations not listed on the equation sheet? Fin efficiency equations, semi-infinite equations, effectiveness NTU equations, etc. 
So you'll definitely be given the equation sheet. I think that effectiveness in NTU are probably things that you want to memorize. Those will not be on, on the equation sheet. I think the fact that you don't have a semi-infinite equation might tell you something about what's on the exam. Fin efficiency, again, fin efficiency and fin effectiveness are probably definitions you should know. And if you know the definition, you can probably work out the equation. So those are things that you should probably memorize. So you will sometimes be given supplemental information on the exam, but usually that will be in the form of other tables, uh, sort of things that you would normally look up in the, um, in the textbook. There's another question here. Uh, will each unit have a long answer question on the exam and will one of the questions be about stake? We haven't written all the questions yet, so I don't know if any of them will be about stake, but you certainly could see a transient problem, and I just think stake's a great way to visualize it, um, although it does sometimes make me hungry. I don't know that we're going to... We're not really thinking about the exam in terms of, like, we have three modules in the class, and each problem has to be about one of the modules and part of the reason for that is that the first module like every question is a first module question so I think you'll see stuff some of the more in-depth stuff might be from the second and third modules but really almost every question is is from the first module right so on on the multiple choice you'll you'll have some definitional things and maybe you know you might have to do some quick calculations but then on the long answer stuff i think all of those problems will will be module 1 problems but they could also be module 2 problems maybe you'll have to find a heat transfer coefficient so that you can find a thermal resistance or something right or um or maybe you're doing a heat exchanger problem and you know, in the heat exchanger problems, you have to do a control volume analysis. So I, I don't know if that makes it more or less clear. Hopefully it didn't make it less clear anyway. See, it's really tough with these. Hey, this is Marcus. I have yeah, a question ahead. as well. So just to clarify, um, so, well, while I was watching today's lecture, I think I pretty much understood everything. I guess one thing that I'm having a problem with is thermal resistance um, relating to uh, fins. So, the fin itself, um, is that going to be... Is that going to be uh, related to cross flow at all? So... Problems where we did fin efficiency or fin resistances, um, typically we were given a heat transfer coefficient in those cases. So um, I don't think you'd have a problem where you were doing a heat exchanger and then you're modeling the individual fins in a cross flow heat exchanger using our fin efficiencies. If we look at there was a problem we did, I think it was one of the examples that we did online, where we talked about, I mean, we did say that the fin efficiency was 100%. So in that case, we were basically just saying that the temperature on the surface of the cross flow heat exchanger was constant. So I think we'd probably want to make that kind of assumption in all of our problems. I think when we do an internal convection problem, we're assuming that, uh, or at least a, a heat exchanger problem, we are assuming that the, the temperature, well, I guess it, it can change along the tube, right? But I don't think we're using fins to calculate that. So I, I don't think you would, you would have to do a fin analysis and, a heat exchanger analysis at the same time. Does that answer your question? Okay, gotcha. So 
I was thinking that just because recently with the homework, um, I think the most recent homework, I think problem 11.7, I thought that it was... Convection, internal convection. Mm -hmm. But it seems that I was wrong about that because it said that there was a fin with a thermal resistance. So I was confused about that. But then I looked at the picture, and to me it didn't look like there were any fins involved. So I wasn't sure what that meant with the so, cross flow. Because if it says it has a fin, that means you have to put down... In a cross flow heat exchanger, if it's unmixed on both sides then you could think that it's kind of the flow is going through tubes on one side. But then um, to be unmixed, there has to be channels on the other side. So then that's done by sort of putting fins. So if you think about, um, you know, there would be almost like uh, barriers or fins that are sort of connecting all these tubes that the flow is flowing over. Um, so it might talk about, uh, we definitely did a problem where we then we talked about the fin efficiency being 100%. So then just saying that the temperature on the fins was not changing. So I don't know that we could do an analysis where if you think about flow going through a channel, right? But you're at one particular cross section. So you're at a particular value of X length down the duct. I don't think we know how to do a problem where your temperature is changing along the perimeter at that cross section. So when the problem says something like uh, the fin efficiency is 100%, it's just saying that at any particular cross section, the temperature everywhere on the wall is the same. So the temperature might be changing as you move down the, the duct, but at every 1x... Right, every particular length, you have the temperature in the perimeter of that duct is constant. So I guess that the temperature on the surface is only a function of x, and not a function of uh, like azimuthal position or something. Theta, if it was a round pipe. So that just means like if. The cross flow is not mixed. Oh, sorry, Marcus froze. Yeah. So if it's not mixed, then it will be. If it's unmixed, there are no fins. It would be. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so there no, would be. No, if it's any mixed, fins. if it's sorry, I'm sorry, I misspoke. If it's mixed, on like the air side going over tubes, then there are no fins. If it's unmixed, then there would be fins or some sort of barriers, right? So then I think what it usually says is something like the fin efficiency is a hundred percent. Because the, and that's just telling you that the surface temperature at any given X is constant. So I think what that's telling you, there's nothing you have to do uh, for the analysis. It's just telling you, you can use the same method of analysis that we use for all the other heat exchanger problems. You don't, have, it's, the problem would become much, much more complicated if the temperature was changing along the periphery of the, of the duct at every given position. Okay, gotcha. Um, yeah, I was just asking because on one of the homework questions for 11.7, it was just really confused. So I thought that no fins meant that. Um, yeah, I would, I would have to look at the particular it problem. Say if it was mixed or not mixed. That wasn't given if it was mixed or not mixed. So that's why I was confused. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I don't have the particular problem in front of me. So I, um, but if you do have a particular question about that problem, um, maybe send me an email or something, or we can uh, we can maybe try to set up a meeting and discuss it.
Okay, sure. You're Thank welcome. you. Are there any other questions? All right. Thanks very much, everyone. I will see you on Thursday where we'll go over um, the practice exam that's on the course, the first practice exam that's on the course website. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.